Real Virginia is proudly produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Since 1926, Farm Bureau has been working to preserve Virginia farms and our rural heritage. Visit our website at VAFB.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce the wonderful local products we enjoy. Brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Christmas in the country was very different 150 years ago. Chef John Maxwell has a seasonal salad to brighten up your table. And the Southeastern Farmer of the Year hails from Southside Virginia. <music> Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Welcome back to Real Virginia, everyone. We're coming to you from historic Pamplin Park in Dinwiddie County, where they demonstrate what it was like to live over 100 years ago. Burke Muller reports that Christmas in the Shenandoah Valley was very different back then and very focused on agriculture. Rural Virginia was at the forefront of the Civil War. Life back then was obviously much different than it is now, and that extends to how the holidays were celebrated. One of the many landmarks in Virginia's Civil War history is the Bushong Farm near the New Market Battlefield. Every December, Reenactors help the public understand how Christmas was observed on a late 19th century farm. Christmas is more like Thanksgiving is today. Uh, it's not as much about opening presents and, and waiting for Santa Claus to come. Uh, it's more about sharing a meal with family. Food was the cornerstone of the family celebration, along with religious services. Most of the food was grown right on the farm. Oranges, cranberries, maybe some special treats uh, that are brought in, but pretty much everything is made here in-house. They're growing carrots and potatoes and they're, you know, they're storing those in a root cellar and keeping those fresh. They have an orchard here. They are growing their own apples and pears for desserts. Uh, so we have an apple pie and they're going to make that. Biscuits, uh, you're going to purchase your, um, your flour at some point. Uh, they don't have a grist mill on site. So they're growing their own grain, but they're not refining it here. You're going to purchase your flour and, and to, to make biscuits. They likely had several milk cows uh, to make your butter, your cheese, your cream. Uh, and that, that's all that, of course, a chicken. They are going to have chickens around here. But we, we want the traditional roast chicken or roast turkey. It's, it's, it's appealing to the eye for, <laughs> for the Christmas celebration. Leslie and Tom Mack are both retired school teachers from the area. They are reenactors at the Bushong Farm and play Christmas classics like the First Noel and O Little Town of Bethlehem. We would have prepared something together uh, to play together in the church with everyone else. Um, playing with the family, of course, um, before and after, um, preparation for the holiday celebrations. The Bushong family celebrated all 12 days of Christmas and music was an important complement to the overall celebration. Virginia farm families in the 1860s would have decorated some for the holidays, but the current fascination with a Christmas tree had not caught on in the countryside yet. They would have had the, the garlands and the wreaths and the, um, everything else to make Christmas. During the Civil War, Virginia's Shenandoah Valley was known as the breadbasket of the Confederacy. The valley's fertile farmland and strong transportation network helped keep rations flowing for the Confederate forces throughout the war. Several critical battles were fought in the valley for this reason. Many Virginia barns and crops were burned toward the end of the war as the tide turned against the South, proving how important agriculture was to both armies. The war years tested valley farm families' resources and their resilience, but the Christmas celebrations went on. In the kitchen, we've got several people working, again, preparing your, your Christmas dinner of pies and maybe a roast chicken or a roast turkey. Uh, we have carrots today. We have some potatoes as well. Uh, getting ready for that. Getting ready for Christmas. Every December, you can visit the Bushong Farm and see for yourself how Christmas was celebrated 150 years ago in rural Virginia. Check the Virginia Museum of the Civil War's website for details. In Shenandoah County, Virginia, I'm Burke Moeller reporting. 
The Battle of Newmarket was one of many important Civil War conflicts fought on Virginia farms. Between the First Battle of Bull Run on a farm in Northern Virginia and the surrender of the Confederate Army outside the farming town of Appomattox, more than 100 battles occurred in rural Virginia. That's more than anywhere else in the country. In addition, many farmers saw their crops and livestock confiscated by both armies during the war years. To this day, Virginia farmers continue to find uniform buttons and other relics from past battles on their land. I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about how you can help pollinators in the garden. Stay with us. Farm Bureau is the insurance provider of choice for farmers. But did you know all Virginians can benefit? In fact, most of our members are not farmers. Members may take advantage of discounts on selected autos, trucks, mowers, and tractors on top of the many insurance offerings. Your $40 membership will easily pay for itself with their many savings options as well. Farm Bureau is made for Virginians. To learn more about the membership advantage, go to VAFB.com or visit your local Farm Bureau. It may be winter now, but gardeners are already planning on what to plant next spring. Mark Viette has some tips on how to help pollinators next year in the garden. It's not just honeybees that pollinate plants. There are so many other species of insects. Even spiders pollinate plants. Spiders are not insects. In addition to the honeybees, you have bumblebees, carpenter bees, wasps, moths, flies, and a whole variety of butterflies that come during the day. And during the evening, you may not see all the moths that come to your garden. All of these insects help pollinate a lot of our native plants. One of the things you can consider doing if you have enough property you know, we just call this our meadow garden. Some of these plants like the goldenrod and solid asters and asters are native. Then we have the beautiful blue or purple azuratum or napita, one of the catmids we have. All of these things insects enjoy. Plant as many of these things as you can in this sort of rough area that you let kind of go native. In addition, you can plant garden plants around your home, like butterfly bushes, blue mist shrubs, salvias, that will attract hummingbirds and pollinators all season long. Consider planting all your butterfly and hummingbird and pollinator plants right around your patio or someplace where you can sit in the garden. And right in front of me, uh, this is my number one favorite plant for hummingbirds, salvia black and blue. And um, we'll put chairs right in front of these salvias here. And you know, the hummingbird was just here a minute ago and they'll come right in front of you and feed on the plant. And right behind me and beside me, I have the great butterfly shrubs. And behind that, I have the blue mist shrub, which is caryopteris and the bumblebees love it. And against the back rock garden wall behind me, I have what is known as the hardy plumbago. It's known as serrata stigma. It's a favorite for the clear wing moth. Now, some people call them the baby hummingbird moths. All these plants are easy to grow. You can just sit and enjoy them, filled with pollinators during the summer, late summer, into fall months. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Spinach and sweet potatoes are classic Virginia winter foods. Chef John Maxwell shows us how to use them in a salad next, in the heart of the home. And now, a sneak peek into a day in the life of a Virginia dairy cow. They get their day started. They have some lunch. Get some exercise spend time with their friends, and then end their day with dairy sweet dreams. Real dairy, real life, real delicious. Sweet potatoes taste great, baked or in a pie. 
but in a salad? Chef John Maxwell shows us how to bring this wintertime favorite food to life in a simple salad in the heart of the home. Hi, and welcome to the heart of the home. I'm Chef John Maxwell, and we're here at Meadow Hall in Meadow Event Park in Doswell, Virginia, where every week we get a chance to play with some great Virginia food. Today, it's autumn, it's beautiful. We've got gorgeous sweet potatoes. We're gonna get, uh, play, and we're gonna make a spinach and sweet potato salad. I've right, got sweet potatoes cubed. I'm gonna put them here into a little bit of olive oil. All right, stir these up. Right. Squeeze a little bit of lemon juice on it. All right. And put in a little garlic. All right. Stir this all up good. And I'm just going to turn this out onto a little baking sheet. And get this in the oven. We're going to cook this off for about 20 minutes. Okay, those potatoes are just about done. I'm going to go ahead and build the dressing here. I've got some olive oil in here. I'm going to add some garlic, All right, minced garlic, and get that whisked in there good. I'm going to add some orange juice, All right, a couple of tablespoons of orange juice. All right. And I'm going to squeeze about a half of a lemon in there. Now I'm going to add about uh, two teaspoons of Dijon mustard. And you need to mix that good. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the oven and I'm going to pull out those sweet potatoes and I'm gonna add the hot sweet potatoes into this dressing. Okay, these have gotten nice and brown on the edges. I'm gonna put them right down into this dressing. That'll help cool them off a little bit. All right, and toss that. All right, now I'm gonna add some spinach. Toss that in the dressing as well. Now I like to use one pot or one dish or one pan if it's at all possible. All right. Keeps me from having to wash more. All right. I've got a, a plate here. I'm going to take the spinach and set it on this plate. I want the sweet potato on the top for that color. Okay, now, add some of the dressing all the way around it. Pull out those sweet potatoes. It's got that beautiful fall color, the last green of the season, and the bright orange getting us ready for the cold weather. Now all we need to make this perfect is a good hunk of Virginia cornbread. See you next time. Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at VAFB.com, as well as on Chef Maxwell's website at ChefJohnMaxwell.com. There are 269 commercial sweet potato farms in the Old Dominion, and they raise their crops on 286 acres. That's almost double the number of sweet potato growers from five years earlier, showing the growing popularity of this valuable vegetable. While 25 producers sell sweet potatoes to processors, most growers sell them at local farmers' markets. Sweet potatoes are harvested just before the first frost and can be made into pies and casseroles right away. But if you truly want sweet potatoes, the sugars need to cure. They should be stored in a sheltered, warm spot for at least 10 days after harvest.
Virginia farmers are often unsung heroes, even in their own communities, but not always. Dave Miller reports how one Halifax County farmer just won Southeastern Farmer of the Year for his work in the industry and in his community. The Swisher Sweet Sunbelt Expo Southeastern Farmer of the Year Award recognizes producers who are not only excellent farmers, but also community leaders. Mike McDowell of Halifax County was selected for his excellent conservation work and leadership, both on and off the farm. Mike and Wanda McDowell live on a 1,000-acre family farm that is steeped in heritage. McDowell uses rotational grazing, no-till planting, and buffer zones all around the natural water areas. There are 13 groundwater wells for his livestock, eliminating the need for cattle to drink from streams or ponds. The farm has been named an official clean water farm for using these methods to reduce soil erosion. McDowell started farming at age 16 with his father, and used the profits from his early farm years raising tobacco and row crops to pay for his animal science and agronomy degree at Virginia Tech. This is a fourth generation farm. We're a century farm. And uh, I started out with dad uh, working sort of as a sharecropper. We had sharecroppers back in those days and dad offered me the opportunity to uh, have my own crop. Uh, he would front the expenses as long as I did the work and I could receive the proceeds from it on a share basis. And over time, then we added the Angus cattle. And then it was sort of a fast paced transition really as I think in my mind that over the years we, we evolved into what now is a purebred Angus operation and, and no longer do we do the row crops or the tobacco. McDowell says that he sat down one day and counted 13 local groups where he serves as a board member. He jokingly adds that maybe it's time to add a few more. An award-winning breeder of top quality cattle, he is president of the Halifax County Cattlemen's Association where he helps fellow cattle producers learn how to raise better livestock and promote the beef industry. Mike's wife Wanda says her role as wife, mother, and nana complements Mike's work on the farm and in the farming industry. They have three grown children who have all come back to the farm to continue their careers. Life on the farm has been so rewarding it, because it teaches so many of life's lessons. Um, it was good as a, for biology, teaching our children. It was good for faith to show them that um, we always were dependent upon God. Um, and it showed them their work ethic which I think they took that with them as he went on throughout li their lives. McDowell's daughter, Amanda, is a veterinarian and opened to practice in Southside, Virginia with her husband, John. They're pleased with his recognition and to carry on the tradition of serving their community. We have our jobs to do and we get up and we go and do those to the best of our ability and we don't really think about winning an award for it. We're just trying to be good examples of God's love and do the best we can for each situation that we're given. Not only does he uh, exemplify success and excellence in agriculture, but he does it at each aspects of his life, whether it be service to the community on boards uh, that we've talked about, whether it be uh, service and, and leading by example in his family. McDowell says that in addition to agriculture and family, faith plays a strong role in his daily life. He made a commitment to the church about eight years ago and is now also an ordained pastor. Faith, family, and farm, I mean, in that, that order. And the family is an integral part of what we are. Uh, we have three children. They all three were raised here on the farm. They all three were very much involved in the farm. Uh, they grew up during the era when we were producing flu-cured tobacco, and that involved a lot of, of family work. Uh, early in the morning, late in the day, before dance school or before football, you know, those types of jobs had to take place. Now they've all uh, married. Uh, each one of them has received their doctorate degree, uh, veterinarian, uh, dentist, and an ER doctor. The McDowell's exemplify the rural spirit that keeps our agriculture and family farm life strong. The leadership they provide will help serve their community and family well into the future. In Halifax County, this is Dave Miller.
We're so glad you could join us this week to celebrate all the bounty Virginia has to offer. From the kitchen, to your home and garden, to our wide open spaces, we are proud to say that this is Real Virginia. For everyone at the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a great week. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Between the grocery store and home, these steaks warmed to room temperature, which means it's possible that bacteria have grown. Freezing these steaks will slow the growth of bacteria, but it won't kill them. If Terence leaves this meat out on the counter, he is allowing the bacteria to grow and multiply. He should not leave meat on the counter to thaw. Terence has three options for thawing these steaks safely. He could defrost them in the microwave, but then he should cook them right away. He also could defrost them in the refrigerator, which takes up to 24 hours. Or he could put the steaks in a plastic bag and submerge them in cold water, changing the water every 30 minutes. Keeping these rules in mind will keep your family safe and healthy. Looking for these? You drive buzzed, it could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. You're going to need me. You're going to need us. All of us. You're going to need our technical skills. Our math. Our engineering skills. You're going to need our help with your water. Your air. Your food. You're going to need our organizational skills, our problem-solving skills. You're going to need our determination, our honesty, our compassion. You're going to need the next generation of leaders to face the challenges the future will bring. And we promise we'll be there when you need us. There are 30,000 roadway accidents each year involving cars and farm machinery. Farmers will be moving equipment for planting and harvest season. The slow-moving vehicle triangle in red and fluorescent orange colors and flashing lights allow for quick identification. When you see an SMV sign on farm equipment, slow down, prepare for sudden stops, and slow turns. Patients will save lives. Just remember we all need to share the road, we all need to be responsible, and we need to be guided by the law. Motor vehicle safety starts with you. There's a lot of tree branches and dry brush over here. We should probably move the bonfire over there. I'm guessing Smokey liked that idea.